Okay, folks, we're going to try this new reality, which is me hanging out far away from all of you, still trying to deliver information, lecture material, and, and stuff like that. So the plan is I'm going to go through PowerPoint slides like I normally would in class. I'm going to talk about the stuff in the same way that I would. The difference will be that this is not live. You can't ask immediate questions and all that, but hey, we'll uh, we'll do what we can here. All right. And also with this, with any of this stuff, if anything is not working for you, if you're having issues, or, you know, whatever it might be, or if you just have normal questions you would ask if we weren't in the midst of this this whole coronavirus, COVID-19 quarantine self-isolation situation uh, you know just just ask away through canvas through email uh, you know I'll be monitoring this stuff getting back to you as best I can as quickly as I can so we'll, we'll try to make this all make sense all right so without further ado let's get into this lecture on modern climate and specifically uh, modern climate regions around the uh around the world so the plan is i'm going to get into just you know what climate is because we've discussed climate change briefly and i'm going to get into what that means and and that'll be the the subject of the next lecture uh but you know we'll get into what, what do we mean when we say climate because it's very different from what we've already been speaking about and then we'll spend most of the time talking about how we map out these separate climate regions and get a sense of, uh, you know, where we have different climates around the world. And again, what, what, you know, should be the case in terms of different climates around the world. So to start, to get a sense of what climate is, we should first get into what weather is, because again, that's what we've been speaking about so far. So weather is a short-term change, okay, in terms of what's happening in the atmosphere. If we're talking about temperature, talking about precipitation, we're looking at what's happening today, right, or what will happen tomorrow or the next day. And we can, you know, look out, you know, five to ten days. Our, our predictive uh, capabilities are getting better, modeling is getting much better so we have a good sense of what we can expect over the next few days but that's still a very short-term concept right whereas with climate we're looking at a long-term pattern of weather we're looking to see what happens over a lengthier period of time we take all of the weather data that exist for an area uh, and we derive patterns from that we get a sense of what a place should look like right what it should um uh you know experience in the winter or in the summer or whatever we're we're also we're dealing with uh not only bigger amounts of time but we typically we look at bigger regions right so like you know here in lancaster or palmdale or wherever you're listening to this from uh you know we we look for the weather for say lancaster california specifically all right, but with climate, we we look more at the climate of the Antelope Valley more broadly, or Southern California in general, right? The Mojave Desert, however you want to lump that together. So it's bigger areas as well as larger scales in terms of time. And this is a it's a classic thing. I didn't make this up. This is used in like every weather textbook. The saying is, "Climate is what you expect. Weather." is what you get right meaning that you can assume that a place is going to be a certain way in the spring summer fall winter whatever but weather can do whatever it wants because stuff happens we have you know weird things take place little atmospheric flukes that occur so we can have snow occur in the summer we can have a you know a hot spell in the winter this stuff does happen just because climate gonna you know makes us think something is going to be a certain way it doesn't mean that we can't have little deviations right but again if you look at it over the long term 
what we see is that weather, um, you know, is a, a short term thing, but long term, when we're looking at climate, we get a sense that, uh, um, you know, this stuff does exhibit this pattern, you know, here in Southern California, warmer in the summer, colder in the winter, right? I mean, that's just pretty straightforward stuff. So here's an example. This is from a you know, few years back now, but God, I remember this summer and it was awful. Uh, and so, you know, the fact that it made the local newspaper should, should tell you something that this was a fluke of some kind, uh, you know, and I have up at the top this question of, is it weather or climate? Um, you know, with this, it may seem like it's long term because we're looking at, you know, 23 days, but this is nothing. Right. This is this is uh, a short blip in the grander scheme of what's going on here in uh, in Lancaster. Right. We don't know. Here's a here's a way to think about it. We don't know if this is normal or not based on the data that are presented here. Right. So this whole idea of 23 days above 100 degrees, that seems hot. But is that normal? Is that what the people of Lancaster can normally expect? Um, is that actually cold, right? Is it, you know, other summers we have uh, 40 days in a row above 100, and this was a fluke because we only had 23, right? So what we need to do when we're looking at climate, when we're looking for these trends, is to look at the big picture, right? Try to get a sense of what's happening over a grander, you know, concept of, of time and space. We'd be interested in what happened previously, right? For as many years previous as we can go. What have summers looked like in July and in August in this region? Um, and then continue to see it and see if this is a fluke or is there an actual trend that summers are in fact warming, right? And that gets into climate change is that while we have these patterns that we're looking for, we will get to a point where we, we start to notice that patterns slowly change and that's what we're seeing now and again i'll get into the whole you know climate change thing next um but that's the general idea so this study of weather and like when i talked about winds and stuff previously um that was meteorology right looking at the, the study of weather the short-term atmospheric changes climatology is what we're looking at now this is what we're shifting to now and so this is as we start to look at climate and that you know term there variability meaning that even though we're looking for patterns this stuff can change over time right so that's what a climatologist does and then this term climatic regions refers to looking at similar weather data similar temperatures and precipitation amounts and stuff like that and grouping it together into these larger regions so we can actually map out areas of similar climate, right? And that's what we'll be looking at as we move forward here. Now, in terms of mapping climate, scale becomes a very important concept. And the idea uh, is that based on scale, that's going to make, you know, some numbers... Um, more important than than others or maybe certain um, you know numbers or answers you you get from places it might not seem that big of a deal but it, it actually is again based on the scale okay and so i have four separate scales here uh, microclimate we're not going to discuss at all it's it's looking at uh, little tiny climates that develop in a small area like around your house right where you're going to have shadows cast uh, on certain sides of the house then on others that's going to affect temperature things like that um so you can have little tiny climates open up in a very small area right mesoclimate we'll look at this this is a regional climate and you can see these the area um in that column there it's kind of a you know it's a rough idea um, but this is, you know, looking locally in a neighborhood at, you know, Antelope Valley College. You could fit um, 
you know, we start to grow into to this stuff where we get bigger and bigger areas, right? Um, you know, we'll look at that macro climate, same kind of deal where we get into more continental sizes. Um, although with these, these numbers, I, I took this from another book. Um, they're kind of fuzzy if you start to, to really map this stuff out. But this is what we'll look at today, right? Kind of, you know, bigger areas, but we're not dealing with global scales here, right? So we'll see that. But then mega climate, when we're talking about looking at the entire globe, this is an important thing to realize that that it is something we study. And you've probably heard, um, you know, statistics thrown out there where, you know, we're, we're going to, you know, rise two degrees over the next hundred years, or, you know, if we don't change our ways or things like that. And honestly, you could hear this this concept of a change of two degrees and not freak out, right? I mean, you know, what's the difference between like in the summer between, you know, 103 degrees and 105 degrees, right? That, that doesn't seem that uh, uh, extreme or whatever. So you might say like, okay, you know what? I'm not going to worry about this climate change. The problem is a number like two degrees uh, uh, in terms of climate change um, is actually, it's connected to mega climate meaning we're looking at it globally right we're getting into this idea of of the entire globe we'll see a change if we look at everything of two degrees which means that some areas will have much higher rates of change others will have lower it's you know it's an average of this gigantic planet on which we live right so some of these numbers might not seem like that big a deal but I'll get into that. Again, we get into climate change. That's the really important stuff that we'll we'll cover here in the next lecture. But but we'll see how these, you know, these things that might not seem like that big a deal, they are a big deal because we're looking at the scale of mega climate versus a meso or micro climate. So yeah, I'm trying to think of what uh to get into here i get yeah i'll talk about this so basically all right we go back to the sun right so the sun drives everything you know heat um is is uh um, influencing a lot of what goes on either obviously through temperature fluctuations also that can affect precipitation and those two things temperature how hot or cold it is in an area uh and precipitation how much water is falling from the sky or not falling from the sky, as you know, in the case in a desert or something like that. That can be, uh, those are the, the two key things that we look at when we're mapping out climates and, and trying to get that normal baseline. All right, so with, in terms of temperature, the sun, uh, as it's connected, one of the key things we have to influence the kind of temperatures you're going to feel and therefore the climate you experience, um, the key thing is latitude right at which latitude are you located so out at the equator in the midpoint between halfway between the north pole and the south pole they're going to get a lot of insulation right incoming solar radiation uh, because they get constant 12 hour days 12 hour nights because the sun's altitude is pretty consistently high up in the sky even if they're not the subsolar point at that specific day right so with this um at the equator hot year round but then as you move further north or south as you move poleward is a term we use so getting closer to either the north pole or the south pole you're going to start to have more seasonal variations right where you can experience a warm summer and a cold winter down in the tropics and at the equator winter isn't the same as we would think about it it's either not noticeable or it's it's so slight that it's not a big deal you're not putting on your parkas or whatever worried about snow in the winter but as we get into the mid latitudes which is where most of us in the united states live we'll experience a you know warm summer cold winter pleasant fall and spring stuff like that and that has to do it goes back to all that tilt stuff we talked about but it also just gets into the fact that the you were not getting this direct 
amount of insulation uh, hitting us. And again, it's, it goes back to all that solar altitude stuff we talked about. And then finally, when you get up to the uh, North Pole or to the South Pole, because it's so far up our, our geoid, right, our round-ish planet, that the sun's rays, as they come in, they come in at such a weak angle that the rays are spread out. The energy is therefore spread out. So you get a smaller amount of solar energy over the same you know, unit of area as you would in the middle latitude or down to the equator. Right, So the higher you go up in terms of latitude, either in the northern hemisphere or southern hemisphere, you're just going to be consistently colder. Okay? So that's the, the most basic, obvious example of this. But we also have what we call temperature controls that can alter this, where even though you know areas may have exist at the same latitude, they'll experience very different temperatures for a you know variety of reasons. And one of the most common is this concept of are you a coastal or continental location? Okay? And so what this is is that uh, ocean, uh, the, the actual ocean itself, right? Big bodies of water. They don't heat and cool at the same rate as land does, right? So water actually heats and cools much more slowly. So if you live near the ocean, you're not going to have these dramatic swings in terms of temperature. Because right? it takes a lot of energy for the ocean to warm up and it you know, needs to lose a lot of energy to cool down. And because that's such a slow process, if you're at a coastal location, you're, just, you're not going to experience crazy uh, temperature fluctuations. The, the ocean is going to kind of regulate your temperatures. Right? But if you're actually um, you know, inland in some continental location, well then... Yeah, you're going to see that because land can heat and cool quite rapidly, right? A, a good example is like if you go swimming, um, you know, in the summer, it's hot and you go, you know, let's just picture it's a, an in-ground pool. You've got concrete um, all around it. So you can be walking to the pool itself. The ground itself is incredibly hot. You're burning your feet and then you get into the water and it's freezing cold, right? Same solar radiation coming down. But that pool water, it's going to take a lot more energy to heat and cool. Whereas the land itself, it'll heat up quite quickly, right? So that's what we're getting into. And this is, you know, a classic example is to show some coastal location here in the U.S. and somewhere in the middle. So you can see we've got San Francisco, California. Over on the coast, that blue dot. We've got uh, Omaha, Nebraska, that red dot. So about as, you know, in the middle of North America as you can get. And then this climograph, the way we read this, is at the bottom. You see the J, F, M, A. That's January, February, March, April. Um, you know, so that's our months of the year. And then the lines are showing um, the average monthly temperature that we've got here, right? So we've got the red line is Omaha. And really what it's showing, the exact numbers aren't important, but it's showing that in the winter months uh, in Omaha, it's cold, right? And in the summer months, it's hot. And you're going to clearly know the difference between summer and winter. Whereas in San Francisco, this coastal location, it's much more consistent year round. Yes, it gets, you know, a little colder in the winter, a little warmer in the summer, but it's still, um, you know, it's, it's still, it's just nice year round to nice to the point of being, you know, just too cold. Um, you know, for a lot of people who are used to, you know, these being more inland, right? So that's the idea. And if you note, too, um, you know, it's showing the latitude is relatively similar. Down in the little description, it's saying Omaha is at 41 degrees north, San Francisco 38 degrees north, roughly the same latitude. So just based on latitude alone, the temperatures, the climate itself should be the same, right? But because of that location, where you are, you know, inside the continent or on the edge, that's going to determine the kinds of temperatures that you experience throughout the year. Okay, now in terms of precipitation, we, I've talked about this before. We're talking about water falling from the sky, right? So rain, um, sleet, hail, snow, like whatever. Primarily the places we're looking at, we'll be talking about rain. Um, 
But still, with precipitation, we of course are interested in how much falls throughout the year. Um, but another thing that we're interested in is when is it falling throughout the year, right? Is it what we call uniform uh, in terms of the precipitation pattern, meaning that it's falling year round consistently? There's no, you know, wet season and dry season or anything like that. It just rains constantly, right? Uh, or it can be high sun maximums, which means that you get the majority of your precipitation in the summer months, right? So you have a relatively dry winter, um, but you get most rain falling in the summer. And it doesn't mean you don't get any rain at all in the winter, but there's a clear shift where more of that is falling in the summer months. And then low sun, that's the opposite. That's where you get most of your rain in the winter. Uh, and then you know, you again can have uh, uh, some rain in the summer, but honestly, it's pretty dry throughout there compared to what happens in the winter months. And so with California, if you think about it, uh, and I know it can be tricky uh, for those of you at, at ABC because we live in the desert and we don't get rain ever. Um, but honestly, when you think about it here in California, we are low sun, right? We get the majority of our rain in the winter and in fact that's a great thing about california and the summer here is that honestly it's weird if we get rain during the summer we can have a fluke thunderstorm or whatever depending on where you're located but we're pretty much you know we have a drought um you know just normally speaking from what you know may to september october right that's normal for us and it turns out when you look at climates around the rest of the world that's kind of weird. A lot of people uh, don't expect that. So we'll see how, you know, California is quite unique in its specific climate region compared to the rest of the world. And so this map is showing precipitation, where it falls yearly, you know, average out, so mean annual, the average, you know, yearly precipitation is what that's saying. And there are, you know, very... Uh, um, obvious patterns at work here. We already talked about the ITCZ. Um, I think at least for some of you in your classes, I'll be covering that uh, in here. But it, it's the idea that because of that Hadley cell, and where we have air converging down at the equator and in the tropics here, we get a lot of precipitation, a lot of rainfall. And it's no surprise that this is also where we find tropical rainforests uh, around the world, where we have some of the densest, most lush vegetation. We have these areas of incredible biodiversity, you know, in the Amazon, right down here in South America, the Congo of Central Africa, and throughout in Malaysia and Borneo and, and throughout Southeast Asia, we get the same thing. Just incredible, um, you know, rainfall and therefore an incredible climate. And that leads to incredible biology right so we see um, all of this rainfall here we also have areas that are incredibly dry like with the sahara you see the arabian peninsula and so on and we'll, we'll get into how that works as well right so temperature precipitation these are the two things we're really looking at to get a sense of what a place's climate you know is like and should be like based on you know, years and years of, of, you know, accumulating these weather data, turning it into climate patterns. And let's, you know what, forget it. Let's get through this. Um, Kirpin's a guy here worth mentioning. And I only really mention it because this is the system we're going to use. Most, like, beginning geography textbooks use this guy's system or a variation of it. Uh, and Kirpin simply, he was a guy who looked at um, temperature, and precipitation to be able to map stuff out uh, around the world, get a sense of what climate was like, and then connect it to life, right? The biology of the region itself. Okay? And in fact, well, uh, let's skip that. Let's just get here straight to this. So the idea, what you'll see with all the stuff that I'll be talking about from here on out uh, are these little letter codes, right? That are either two or three letters long and so like a f it's a capital a lowercase f this is the tropical rainforest climate that we're going to be talking about okay and so the a 
That stands for tropical, um, meaning referring specifically to latitude, but that also means that it's warm to hot year round. Okay, and then F, weather is constantly wet. That's that uniform precipitation pattern, right? It rains year round. We'll see examples of that. And so with all of these climates, like there are these, you know, flow charts and stuff. So you can actually map this stuff out. We're not going to be doing them at all. So don't worry about it. But this is just how Kirpin system works. You start looking at temperature as well as, you know, location. And in some cases, we look at precipitation first. And then we, you know, look a little more at precipitation and so on. So just all of these climates that we see, they're going to have these weird letters. That's the Kirpin system. Okay, but don't stress. I'm not going to give you, you know, temperature data and have you classify this stuff in here. I just want you to be aware of what, what it is you're seeing. All right, let's just skip that. Let's get to the good stuff, right? So I'm going to get into um, a handful of these climates. And the rule of thumb is, honestly, like the ones I spend more time talking about, those are the ones I'll most likely be writing a test question on right because i think they're interesting enough to talk about for more than 20 seconds right so then if something else like the tropical savannah climates uh that aw it's not that thrilling uh which means i'm not gonna you know be agonizing over the perfect test question for that right so just pay attention to this what i'm talking about will kind of help you guide you through what it is you need to study so let's start with this first one the tropical rainforest climate which is uh located at that itcz area it's you know close to the equator and you can see with this map it gets kind of fuzzy where we have the tropical rainforest and then the monsoon and then you know the savannah stuff and, and all of that um kind of transitioning out there don't stress too much on the exact locations because these can be kind of again fuzzy boundaries but that tropical rainforest is where we see uh, areas of you know incredible precipitation hot temperatures and therefore these rainforest ecosystems and biomes right so to make sense of it like we've got an example here in northern brazil again the climograph idea months of the year running along the bottom here so january february march and so on the green bars in here represent precipitation and so it's green and red sorry if you're colorblind and and you can't see it but honestly what it it is the bar graph part is precipitation okay the line up here is temperature and we've got you know metric stuff over here and and you know american stuff on this side just reference here uh you know because it's america um so we've got inches in terms of precipitation. And so what we can see looking at this is even though like September, it dips down. It's about like, you know, five, five and a half inches of rain in September for perspective. That's, you know, that's like us in a good year here. Um, there's so much rain falling in this area consistently year round that we don't see a true dry season. Right. So it's not a high sun or low sun thing. This is uniform and the total throughout the year it's 109 inches that's you know a staggering amount of rain for you know any californian to try to conceive of um this line up here is looking at these average temperatures and you can see it it wiggles a little bit here but honestly that's hot year round and so hovering around you know 80 degrees which that might not sound too hot but keep in mind that's the average right so it can get a little cooler than that at night but it also can get a lot warmer than that during the day so it's really there's just no cooling period going on and with all this rain it's also you know humid so you you feel the heat uh, in that way as well and so with this heat with this precipitation we get these rainforests these incredibly dense um you know forests around the the middle of the planet and at the end of the semester i'll be getting into the actual you know biology what's going on in here it's a fascinating ecosystem to study so we'll talk about what makes it fascinating what's you know unique about it why these things are you know worthy of our preservation we'll talk about the 
the issues of, you know, recent stories of, of the Amazon being on fire and, and, you know, is it Brazil's fault and, and how we need to think about this stuff. So we'll cover that later on. But in the meantime, just want to get, you know, more into the, the how this thing works, right? And so with it, the reason why we have the hot temperatures and precipitation, it's all connected to latitude, okay? So this is completely dependent on the fact that these climate regions are in a specific location, okay? So we get that consistent day length, right? Because it's, and we see these, generally speaking, between 10 degrees north and 10 degrees south, okay? So real close to the equator. And again, that means 12 hours a day, and during these 12-hour days throughout the year, the sun is more or less directly overhead, right? Uh, we also have that intertropical convergence zone, which is our black line in here, and that shifts throughout the year. But what this is showing um, is where that Hadley self, we go back to that concept where we have air coming from the North Pole, from the South Pole, it converges, meaning the stuff bumps together um, at the equator, it gets pushed up. And as I've spoken to at least some of you guys, as air goes up, rain is going to fall down, right? So this vertically moving air is going to lead to, you know, condensation, clouds are going to form, precipitation, rain is going to fall. So where these two air masses come together and get pushed up, we call that the ITCZ, the Intertropical Convergence Zone. Okay, this zone where, you know, in the tropics where these air masses converge and therefore get pushed up, right? So the name actually means something here. And this fluctuates throughout the year. So this one is showing January and then July. This thing will move and that gets into, you know, the tilt of the earth and the changing subsolar point and some other factors at work. So stuff we discussed previously. Um, but that's that's why this thing moves. But these tropical rainforest climates more or less exist right underneath this thing or pretty close to the ITCZ year round. And therefore, they get these incredible amounts over 100 inches of rain throughout the year because they just happen to be where these air masses are converging. Okay? Um, that's pretty much what I said. The doldrums thing. Let's skip that. It's an image of, uh, you know, tropical rainforest, just, you know, very dense vegetation. Um, and, and, you know, and you would think with this that, the you know, just because of all this rain and because we already have plants everywhere, that it'd be an incredibly fertile area. What's kind of crazy is that the soil is garbage when it comes to, you know, planting stuff and agriculture and, and things like that. When When humans actually clear out you know, existing tropical rainforest vegetation and then try to plant something, you find that the soil has no nutrients. And this is what this picture is trying to show. If you look at the actual, uh, um, you know, soil itself, just that kind of yellowish, um, you know, bland, homogenous soil, there's not a lot of plant food in there, not a lot of nutrients in the soil. And that's because with all this rain coming through, a lot of the, you know, plant food that would develop these, you know, important chemicals in the soil that can help plants grow, that stuff gets washed out into these massive rivers and then out into the oceans and all that. So the, the existing indigenous plants, the things that have evolved to exist in this tropical rainforest climate, they can handle it. They have kind of their own, you know, composting mechanisms and all discuss some of that stuff again later on when we get into the biology um, but for humans to be able to to uh, um, you know farm in this area they practice what is often called slash and burn agriculture which is pretty straightforward um, but it's the idea that you slash a portion of the rainforest right so we see up here um, in the upper left so we cut this stuff down uh, and then you burn it right again you know that's not a clever name or whatever it's what's going on and there are other terms like shifting and swidden cultivation and stuff like that but slash and burn lets you know what you're dealing with so this stuff is burned and that's an important process in fertilizing the soil that ash is plant food 
And so once you've burned it and it's, you know, cooled off and all that, you plant your crops, which is what we see here. And you can get, you know, a good four or five years of productive farmland um, in doing this. But eventually all that ash, you know, it's used up, right? The plant food is gone. And so what you do um, is, you know, while this starts to, to no longer produce what it once did, you know, move over to the side. Right. You abandon this area right here where you initially cut it down. You cut this down, you burn it and you just leave this initial one alone. Right. And over like 20 years, that will return to, you know, normal rainforest. It will come back. It's this concept of succession. We'll talk about that later on. When we get into the biological biogeography stuff. Um, but it's the idea that that forest will return if it's left alone for enough time and so while you're waiting for that you just move over here and then when this one doesn't work you move over to another location and you keep moving around till you know maybe 30 years 40 years something like that down the road you wind up back here again right so it's a way to move this stuff around and it just goes to show that fire um, is not necessarily a bad thing now when we have all of the rainforest on fire that is bad but it, it's a complex thing and we'll discuss that as well and that it's also very heavily tied to climate right climate as we'll see and one of the reasons why we talk about climate so early on is it influences so much of everything else that goes on um in terms of you know life as well as the geology and, and some of this other stuff that we'll we'll be covering all right so that's tropical rainforest now tropical monsoon is uh, similar in the sense that we have hot temperatures, we have a lot of rainfall, but there is a definite uh, dry season and definite rainy season. And it's completely connected to the ITCZ. Okay? It's the idea of it moves into Southern Asia and then out of Southern Asia throughout the year. Right, And so this, looking in India... In southern India, you can see a little dot at the end of the this uh, um, you know massive peninsula that is uh, India and just South Asia in general. Um, here we have temperature, same idea, hot year round. Uh, we have rain falling quite significantly, and you can see it's 72 inches. But we have a distinct rainy season and dry season, and it's completely dependent on the fact that the ITCZ moves into asia um you know throughout the year and then back out right so in the winter months when it's dry that itcz is down here in the indian ocean not affecting these folks here right and then as the summer progresses we see more rain that's the itcz moving up so where that air is converging it's causing this precipitation to fall but it's also it's moving north throughout the um throughout the year and so we have a lot of rain falling down and you can see this this kind of u shape right here so this is where the itcz is directly overhead and then it continues to move northward so it goes past this particular region of india but then it also it has to come back down so this extra burst in november is the itcz passing back through here and heading back out to the ocean okay so it's you know the monsoon very similar but it's the idea that you have a distinct rainy season and a distinct dry season and this is kind of showing it and it's don't worry about the pressure and the winds and all that stuff we're not a weather and climate class so we're not going to dwell on it just remember that idea of of you know rainy and dry and it's also you know again looking at how climate determines everything you can see incredible pictures of just life progressing right during um during the monsoon that you have to just continue to exist um d you know despite crazy conditions which is kind of a you know an interesting thing to think about in light of this whole you know coronavirus stuff that we're we're dealing with right but you can see you know images of kids out playing soccer people just trying to have fun i also love the fact that you know we have people in trucks and suvs getting stuck out here in the desert whenever we have flash flooding but you look up here at this little smart car just kind of you know putting through the water doing fine kids having fun it's great and this oh my god found this this is fantastic 
um, romantic monsoon destinations in India. Ah, the fragrance of the earth kissed by the raindrops of the first showers of the monsoon is an intoxicating experience to the olfactory senses. Right? This the whole idea uh, is that it's so romantic to be stuck in some hut uh, or whatever with that special someone and it's just raining outside all the time. And oh, yeah, so romantic. Here's the crazy deal. So this I found online like a week or two um, after the worst monsoon in recent history. Um, so in the summer of 2017... Yes, this monsoon came in as it normally does, but the rainfall was so massive that flooding was everywhere. You had death, you had, you know, destruction everywhere. It was terrible. And it just goes to show how clueless we can be on the other side of the world when we're not affected by the monsoon. You know, this is one of the more tone deaf posts that uh, um, could be put out there uh, to talk about how romantic it is when people are actually dying and of course we didn't really pay attention to this because if you look at the timing of it so this is august of 2017 this is the exact same time when houston is underwater because of hurricane harvey so we're dealing with our own flooding and, and terrifying stuff the same time they're doing that uh over in south asia right and so with this like yeah the monsoon is normal um but the reality is with climate change, we're seeing that it's it's getting more intense, right? It has been getting more intense. It will continue to get more intense. So there are a lot of studies, scientific studies that have gone on modeling the stuff, looking at changes in temperature and how that's affecting changes in precipitation and all of that. And study after study is showing um, that it's just, yeah, this monsoon is going to get worse the the rainfall is going to be more intense not necessarily every single year but we're going to have more of these examples of really heavy flooding and therefore you know just disrupting society right so then that's a it's a good um lesson for us as we're looking through this stuff at what should be normal is to also look at what's happening right now because we're seeing what we expect to be you know the normal summer in a place like india um it's not necessarily the case it's not necessarily normal and it's also a time for us to start thinking about you know what's our own impact on this region right through our own decisions here in the u.s the choices we're making in terms of energy consumption and the the type of energy we're using and and stuff like that um you know we're impacting this right we're not the only ones it's not just the u.s but we're a pretty massive major force um you know with this and so that's again something we'll be talking about thinking about how our own actions are affecting these climate regions around the world okay the tropical savannah as i said no big deal it's kind of this transition zone where we leave this whole uh, tropical region and start getting into the subtropics and the mid latitudes um and we'll just we'll just leave it there you can see you know start to see some seasonal temperature fluctuations a little less rain um but yeah no big deal vegetation not quite as dense maybe um but definitely you know more lush than we see here in southern california okay so that's our a classification now b um these are our arid climates so this doesn't take into account latitude this is actually looking at precipitation you know no matter where it's occurring so arid meaning dry right these are our deserts of the world and we see them all over at a variety of locations okay and and you can see that just looking at these maps you have stuff you know close to um or in the tropical region so here's the where are we right here the equator right here along the horn of africa we can see some of these b climates we also have stuff up here in the mid latitudes um it gets kind of fuzzy in terms of uh um you know classification but we also technically have deserts um you know in polar regions as well right so this stuff can happen anywhere and what Kirpin did with his system was divided the uh, um, 
you know, this climate into two subcategories. You're either an arid desert or BW uh, or semi-arid steppe or BS is the, the um, you know, a little abbreviation for that or the code for that. All right. So an arid desert is drier than a semi-arid steppe. And an arid desert is simply it's a region where the precipitation is less than one half of the natural moisture demand. This goes back to like evapotranspiration and that water budget stuff we talked about previously, right? So you can think of it simply as they get less than 50% of the water that's needed um, to just kind of break even, right? In terms of water coming in and water going out. So less than 50. A semi-arid step is where they get more than that 50%, but it's still less than 100%, right? So an area that gets, say, 32% of the, um, you know, rain that it actually needs, that's an arid desert. An area that gets 74% of the rain it needs. It's still dry, but it's not as dry, and so we call that a semi-arid steppe. Yeah, that's the distinction in here. Okay, now this stuff can happen anywhere, as I said. Uh, some of it is connected to latitude, and that's the subtropical high-pressure cell, which is the result of this Hadley cell, where you have the air converging at the ITCZ, okay, that gets pushed upward, and then gets kicked back toward the poles, but then it's pulled back down around 30 degrees, um, north or south, okay, and so as that air comes down, it's the opposite of air going up, it means there's no rain, okay, so air coming down, Leads to clear skies, fair weather, all that kind of stuff. So as a result, areas of the, of the Earth that are between you know 15 to 30 degrees north or south, they can be desert simply because they're near and influenced by these subtropical high-pressure cells. It's an area where just no rain comes in because of the nature of moving air. Okay, So that's one way we can have an arid or semi-arid climate. Okay, The rain shadow... In fact, that's another way, um, which is what we have here in the Mojave Desert. Okay, and we, we talked about this with the Chinook winds and all of that. But with the Sierra Nevada, air as it's coming across from the western side, it gets pushed up. Rain is falling down on the western side of the state. And then as that air moves over and descends, comes down the mountains into the eastern side, we get that fair weather, right? There, we just get you know, strong winds and dry air and all of that blowing down in here. So we, in the eastern Sierra and the Mojave Desert itself, we're a desert primarily because of this rain shadow effect, right? Or we have some areas like Central Asia is a great example of this, uh, where it's just, it's so far away from the ocean. It's surrounded by so much land that these rain clouds can't make it inland far enough. So it's just... It's isolated from this, um, from rain, from precipitation, from coming in, right? So the Gobi Desert, the just, you know, Mongolia uh, in general, it's a very dry area because of its location, because it's so far away from the oceans. And so because of this, because we have, uh, you know, pretty similar reasons for deserts to exist, and really a desert is simply an absence of precipitation and absence of water coming in you can see that a lot of deserts around the world they look quite similar um you know two pictures here where we're you know in north africa on the left and then we're here in you know california on the right you can see and this is a source of pride um californians and my especially my mojave desert people you can see we look just as desolate um and sad and miserable and dead as some of the most famous deserts around the world, right? We're pretty, we're pretty hardcore. Um, so you know, we got we got that going for us. Um, and looking at climate graphs, so here's Yuma. So we're getting away from the Mojave, but it's it's an example that that uh, um, works here. Um, you know, Arizona has a different desert. It's got part of its Mojave, but then you really transition into the Sonora Desert. We'll we'll talk about distinctions like that later. Um, but you can see from the precipitation right here, they get nothing, right? Three inches of rain per year. Uh, and you get these temperature um, fluctuations here because of 
latitude, right? So because we're technically in the mid latitudes here at 33 degrees north, we see this fluctuation in terms of a summer and winter because we're, you know, farther from the tropics because we have differences in day length and, and things like that. But still, in terms of precipitation, nothing is going on, right? And so here in the Mojave, like here in the Antelope Valley specifically, in the Mojave within California, and it stretches up into Nevada and into Arizona, but, you know, throughout here, um, we have a, a variety of kind of sub-regions in the area. But honestly, for the most part, we see that we are, you know, quite similar to the Sahara or any of these other world-famous deserts in terms of, of summer months and the temperatures we experience. Like, we technically... We hold the record here in the Mojave for the hottest temperature ever recorded. And while there's some debate about whether or not that's a legit number, it's still, we get, you know, unbelievably hot. But at the same time, we can also have colder winters here uh, than some of these other deserts. And it all gets back to latitude because we're farther, you know, north or farther poleward than some of these other deserts that we see closer to the equator and the, and the tropics themselves, right? So we can be, yeah, how, how's that for, for living in a wonderful place, right? Unbelievably hot, hottest place in the world, and also incredibly cold. Um, yeah, best of both worlds, right? But, I mean, that is something. We will be talking more about deserts throughout the rest of the semester because we should be aware of that. And I'm, you know, speaking to those of us who, you know, are living here in the Antelope Valley, in the Mojave Desert itself. I mean, there's really incredible desert stuff going on. See these ripples in the sand. This picture was taken not too far from where I'm, you know, recording this right now. What are those tracks? Come on, you got this. What is it? Obviously, it's a no, Roadrunner, right? None of you got that. Um, we'll get into that and how fantastic Roadrunners are. They're an incredible bird and this incredible predator uh, out here. We've got some pretty cool stuff. So we'll talk about, you know, the climate a little more, but we'll also get into what does that mean for the life around here, as well as the geology and, and this other stuff that we'll continue to cover. Um, here's an example of a semi-arid steppe. This is Astana, you know, the capital city of Kazakhstan. Uh, apparently... Well, I've heard I've never been here, but I've heard that this, like the city is set up. I mean, look at this awesome hawk or whatever that is. That is, that is fantastic. Um, but apparently they set up the city. Um, so like you take the picture from this angle and it looks awesome. But if you turn just a little bit left to right, it's not quite as photogenic. Um, so it's like the ultimate kind of social media city, right? It's designed to like have this, this one selfie um, perspective and it looks glorious. And then everywhere else, it's just kind of dry and no big deal. Um, but looking at the precipitation, it's doing better than a place like Yuma, but still 11 inches of rain per year. Technically still not meeting that natural moisture demand. All right, so those are our arid and semi-arid climates that we've got. Here's another one, Iran. And these have traditionally led to nomadic lifestyles. And let's, let's move on. All right, and so now we're at our C category which are called mild mid-latitude climates or sometimes called mesothermal climates um referring to it's kind of it's like this goldilocks thing not too hot not too cold right where we see seasonality we see warmer summers colder winters things like that but these the the mild term right there means that those winters aren't that bad right not covered in you know feet of snow um throughout the summer or whatever, All right? So we have two I'm going to focus on here, the humid subtropical, or CFA, and then the Mediterranean climate. And that's CS, it can be A, B, we have some fluctuations in here. But these exist in the southern United States on opposite sides of North America here, right? So the first one, humid subtropical, um, we'll look at the CFA Right, covers this area, and I say, you know, southern. I mean, we're stretching up uh, in here, but you know, it's not the the cold Midwestern stuff we tend to think of. It's it, and we'll primarily look at you know stuff down here on the the Gulf Coast um, as we cover this. And then you can see CSA, this Mediterranean climate. It's over here on the West Coast. We have a lot of dry stuff in here, 
you know, that's where we see a lot of it in the desert uh, in North America. Um, but over here, California, on uh, stretching up into the Pacific Northwest uh, a little bit too, we have this Mediterranean climate. So I'll cover both. And so this humid subtropical, the characteristics are warm temperatures, although we, we definitely have this, this seasonal fluctuation you can see from the climographs down here. Um, but we also have high humidity. Okay, so and that's humidity is simply you know moisture, water vapor that's in the air. So in California, we got no humidity. It's just it's a case where like technically we can have it and can fluctuate and all that. But compared to other parts of the country or the world, our humidity is about non-existent. Or we just don't have that much water vapor in the air. Whereas in this humid subtropical climate, especially in the summer, you feel it. It can be oppressive. It can make, um, you know, temperatures feel way worse. So it might only be 90 degrees, something that wouldn't be a big deal here in California. But 90 degrees in a place like Louisiana is going to feel awful when that humidity is up high. It's like somebody's taking this wet blanket and just wrapping you in it. It can be, you know, hard for us Californians to breathe. Um, whereas, you know, family I have who lives in the South, they can hardly breathe out here in our dry air and they love that high humidity, right? So it's just, it's a different feel. And then also there's, you know, high amounts of precipitation compared to a place like, you know, California. Um, and it's, it's a high sun maximum, uh, is what we, we see. So most of this rain is falling in the summer months. And these are specifically found on East Coast, at a specific latitude, it gets back to, to these, you know, Hadley cells and different atmospheric, um, you know, movements and conditions and things like that. But what's cool is you see these two climographs. We've got Charleston, South Carolina, and then Shanghai, China, right? Roughly the same latitude. They're both East Coast. Now, culturally speaking, these are worlds apart, right? Two totally different areas of the world. But from a climate perspective, you know, they effectively look the same, right? So you're going to experience the same weather, um, you know, and therefore climate, um, regardless of what's going on culturally, right? So that's that's kind of a cool, you know, thing to see how similar this stuff is. Um, here's a picture. It's it's not the greatest picture, but I showed this was in southern Louisiana. Uh, simply took it because if you look at it, you've got that tree uh and then you've got plants growing on the tree right we've got plants on plants like that as a californian that that should should amaze you which is exactly why i took the picture uh and you know and that has to do with not only the precipitation coming in but just the humidity and stuff like that things that would instantly dry out here in the uh, mojave desert they're able to thrive because of this specific climate these are a uh, mangrove roots here these exposed roots this is in uh, key west florida um this is a case where again it would completely dry out here um in the you know southern california you know regardless of whether you're technically in the mojave or not but these exposed roots they work uh in this place in this humid subtropical climate and it it affects a lot of stuff in terms of you know the flooding nutrients that can be trapped uh in this area it becomes a habitat for certain members of the ecosystem and so on but incredibly foreign and exotic um you know for a, a californian to see and in this picture you've got this incredibly handsome young man here on a boat and this is in the uh Atchafalaya basin and again this is back to uh, southern louisiana so just this incredible massive swamp and what are we uh what are we taking this boat out to find yeah alligators of course i mean that's the whole point here is to go out here and see these creatures and really if you've never thought about it alligators i mean they're just they're dinosaurs right that were tougher than the dinosaurs because while you know dinosaurs are going extinct because they can't handle climate fluctuations or whatever the alligators are like we're cool uh and and so they just kind of continue to exist. I mean, they are incredible to see up close. And and if, if you ever get a chance, go find um, a Cajun man to take you out into the swamp, uh, into a place like this, because it was 
fantastic. And this guy, um, he was putting on a good show. He's throwing raw chicken out into the swamp and pulling all these different, you know, alligators toward him. And he's, he's got them all named, which I'm sure is complete BS. He can't tell one from the other, but he's doing it for, you know, the rubes from California who don't, uh, know any better right but he's like oh that that sweet pea she my share and he you know he's calling her over and throwing uh um you know raw chicken and stuff like that and he's trying to put on a good show and so he's dangling raw meat right over the edge of the boat uh and the alligator just lunges out of the water takes the chicken but also you know bites his hand and he just all he does is goes like wooey that hurt and that was it and he was totally cool i mean he had blood and probably salmonella he probably died like a week later i don't know um, never talked to the guy again, um, but it was incredible. Uh, and just to see these alligators like up close, not looking sad. Like you can see alligators in zoos around Southern California and they just look sad and miserable. And it's probably because we have no humidity because the, you know, the climate isn't right. But what's crazy is to think that this is not too far away from California, right? Like all you, honestly, all you got to do, you want to go see this? Hop on the 10, drive for a couple of days, uh, and you're there, right? You're in the same place. So same latitude, but again, radically different ecosystem because of differences in climate, right? Because of all these differences, we can have things like, you know, alligators, these, these leftover dinosaurs that are still cruising around, while here in California, we have nothing even remotely close to that. I mean, it's just remarkable all right so that's that humid subtropical but then the mediterranean radically different because we're now we're on the west coast as opposed to the east coast that's going to be affected by different um you know these these different you know climate uh patterns or these atmospheric patterns it gets back to stuff like the hadley cell um these subtropical high pressure cells can affect california even where we don't have um you know, the, the full on desert caused by it, it moves out in the Pacific ocean and that affects the rain that we experience. Right. So a lot of California falls into this, this uh, Mediterranean climate. Um, but we also see like in the Mediterranean itself, hence the name, they experience it, um, you know, down here in Chile, uh, we've got, you know, South Africa, Western Australia, just all these West coasts, around the world, um, these climates are experienced. And so here in California, um, because we're in this West Coast, because we exist within this specific latitude, the primary thing is we have the low sun maximum um, precipitation pattern, right? We have wet winters, dry summers. And it also, because of the location and all that stuff, it also means our winters aren't that bad. We don't get that much snow, if we even get snow at all, right? So it's not incredibly cold in the winter, and it's also in the summer, it is dry, okay? So you can see that with this uh, precipitation pattern right here. And so we're back to San Francisco looking at this um, stuff. But you can see the, you know, relatively dry summers. And depending on where you are exactly, in California, will determine if you even like in June if you even get any rain, period, right? Um, and so this is another case of uh, simply you know location. Don't worry, I'm not going to get into the current and all that, but it's it's our actual location here. the The temperature of the Pacific Ocean, the current of the water, with these high pressure cells moving, um, you know, up and down throughout the year. That's causing this. Right. And it's another case, too, of with this, we see very similar um, results, even on, you know, opposite sides of the planet. So this one, you know, is showing San Francisco here in California and then in Spain and the the ideas. I mean, if you look at it, that's not San Francisco. Um, you know, clearly that's outside of it. Uh, but still, you get the general idea where we have, you know, oak woodlands, um, this scrub vegetation, brown grasses in the summer. Right, because we don't get rain, so our grass just kind of you know goes dormant, it dies for the summer, and then it comes back when the rains come back, right? But looking at this, actually, give me a hint, um, or give me an idea for uh, for a game that we could play. And then, you know, in this uh, time of uh, uh, you know, health crisis around the country, 
you know, what better time to, to play a game, right? So I call the game, see if you can follow along. I call it Spain or California, huh? All right, so let's, even though we're, we're totally isolated here, we can still play along. So what do you think? Is this Spain or California? Did you guess? Okay, it's, uh, this is California. I don't know if you got it or not, but good for you if you did. All right, but this one, Spain or California? This one's California uh, again. But this one, Spain or California? California. Actually, I don't have any, I've never been to Spain. So I don't have any pictures of Spain um, at all. And you know why I've never been to Spain? Because it would look like this. All of my pictures would look just like the pictures I have from where I live. Don't go to Spain it's a waste of time, right? And you can say, like, oh, no, I want to go because, you know, they speak Spanish there and it's a different culture. Like, we speak Spanish here, right? We have, we have go to a mission uh, here. You can get the same Catholic vibe uh, if you want that. It's all the same. Uh, and that, again, it has to do with this similar climate. Once you get away from the people and the buildings and the culture itself, very eerily similar, um, you know, ecosystems. And you won't necessarily see the exact same species of things and and that has to do with uh you know evolution and some stuff we'll talk about uh this idea of you know evolving in isolation and all that but still very similar types of vegetation um you know exist because of that very similar climate pattern all right now these final ones here i'm going to quickly go through them a because i'm they're not, they're not that exciting, but B, because I'm, uh, I'm cold and I'm tired of just talking to myself, uh, in this little, little bunker that I've built for myself. Um, so we'll just kind of go through any of these high latitude climates, the D and the E climates, they, they're cold year round. And that's because of the high latitude, right? It goes back to that idea of solar altitude, affecting the direct amount or in you know not direct amount of solar radiation hitting an area being spread out over an area um so as you go up higher in latitude the sun even at its highest throughout the year isn't going to be that high right so they don't get much solar radiation coming in throughout the year even if the sun is up for you know a month or two months or three months um you know consistently you're still not getting a lot of energy right up there at the pole so this first one d um has to do with stuff like we have you know in in michigan or minnesota or these you know kind of northern midwestern states where you do definitely get you know cold winters or up here in new england right up into canada and then e these are the polar um climates where it's yeah you are extremely far north and so the the cold is going to be even more significant right because you're just going further and further up closer to the pole <laughs> and so yeah don't you know what don't even worry microthermal it's colder um yeah don't worry about that look it's cold this picture I actually took this in april um to give you a sense of how cold this place normally is we get the taiga which means snow forest this is like crazy siberian uh, stuff here we actually have the the coldest temperatures ever recorded um just remarkable and you can see i mean this is you know how people exist there which is eerily similar right look at that um makes you think uh polar even colder yeah there you go it's cold all right that's the whole point point. and then highland our last one here is where the elevation is so high that it mimics these high latitude climates right so it's the idea that you can be near the equator which is the case here with mount kilimanjaro right and so these are always just incredible pictures because you have you know elephants and, and stuff roaming around down here at the base of the mountain in this tropical savanna climate um but then if you go up to the top of the mountain you have glacial ice right you have these polar conditions um and it goes back to that whole idea of normal lapse rate um the idea that in the troposphere our layer of the atmosphere the higher you go the colder it gets right so if we go up in elevation 
even if we're near the equator, even if technically, you, you know, the sun is shining down, you know, consistently throughout the year, if the, the elevation will trump that, right? It will, will make it so that it is this polar um, climate. It's why we can have ski resorts and stuff here in California. We shouldn't, um, you know, just based on latitude and, and stuff like that. But you go to, you know, up into Lake Tahoe, place like Mammoth, June Mountain, because of that elevation, you can have snow falling and staying for longer periods of time. And then, uh, you know what? No. Um, and this, looking at this, even this, you know what? Forget it. Because I'm just, I'm just happy we're done um, with this stuff. Because now we're going to get into, now that we have this baseline, now we're going to get into the good stuff, Right climate change the idea that all of this this normal climate region stuff that i just went into it's not normal anymore stuff is changing radically so next time whenever i you know get around to it look to canvas it'll be posted as soon as i can get this stuff done but next time we'll get into okay we know what should be happening we know what places should be like but what's actually happening right? What's the reality um, today? So we'll get into that. And also, what can we expect in the future? Is it all doom and gloom? Is there any hope or, you know, whatever? I'll get to it. I'll, I'll try to present a very practical look at it. So you have a sense of what's happening and what we can expect. All right, geographers, that's it for now. Talk to you later. <laughs>